So, you know, that is a question that I'm always asked, right? Because I think that what a diplomat actually does is boils down to the heart of human relations, which is building the, those uh, connections. Because, you know, for us, a lot of our bread and butter is, you know, finding out uh, what is happening with the local conditions of a country. Hello and welcome to Tuesdays with Morrissey, where we share insights from great thinkers. Today, I'm excited to be joined by Mike Ang, a diplomat from Singapore, currently serving as regional director in North America for Enterprise Singapore with extensive experience living and working abroad and building long-term relationships across cultures. Mike, thanks for coming on the show. No, well, thanks, Adam, for having me. Absolutely. I'm excited to have a conversation about building relationships at an individual level and a global level. But before we do that, I need a little clarification around what a diplomat actually does. So, you know, that is a question that I'm always asked, right? Because I think that what a diplomat actually does is uh, boils down to the heart of human relations, which is building the, those uh, connections. Because, you know, for us, a lot of our bread and butter is you know, finding out uh, what is happening with the local conditions of a country. And uh, you know, just penetrating into 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 the local scene, you know, getting out there, uh, finding information. And I think that with when it comes to information gathering, uh, one of the key components is building up that trust and that long term, uh, that long term, uh, you know, those long term relationships. And and so what a diplomat does is, you know, essentially we try to win over friends. We try to get people to to. Uh, to, to trust us so that we as foreigners can come into a country and penetrate that layer, you know, beyond just that the trip advisor reviews um, or the National Geographic special in the country. I want to know what makes the people tick, you know, what are some of the foods that they eat? What are the quirks of that culture? And there's, you could read every book, you could watch every documentary of that country, but there's nothing like being boots on the ground or, you know, for diplomats, I like to say wingtips on the ground. <laughs> Um, to actually understand understand a, a, a nation, a culture, its politics, its quirks, and then how can we as a country um, cooperate with them and understand them better? Yeah, it, it definitely. I mean, you're representing your country, but you mentioned you know understanding them better. What's beneath that in terms of like what are the goals that that you're trying to advance? Well. Broadly speaking, it would be to advance uh, Singapore interests, right? Uh, whether it is uh, um, economic interests, right? Finding more maneuvering room economically for us to grow and for companies to play in a bigger field, right? Um, one of the issues for us is that we are a small country, right? Singapore is the size of uh, New York City with a total population of 6 million people. And if you are a company, um, a Singapore company and you've reached a certain size because we don't have that internal market, you would just have to go out and expand. And I think what a diplomat does, I mean, this is a concept of economic diplomacy, is helping our companies open doors. And that is my role. Uh, one of the roles here that I have in the United States is kind of what I call helping to give the comp companies that white glove service and connecting them and and opening the doors for them. And especially when I was in the Middle East and uh, Saudi Arabia was my first posting. Um, and a lot of things that were happening in Saudi Arabia, you couldn't you couldn't just LinkedIn someone or you couldn't Google someone because that information was so opaque. I call it everything was behind the velvet curtain. And so in Saudi, what I had to do was I had to, to use one connection and hope that connection introduced me to some influential, you know, what I would like to call a power broker. Hope the person likes me enough to to invite me to a desert camp retreat, um, a, like an event behind, you know, the high walls of the palaces or of, of, of the diplomatic compounds. And that is where you get the most unfiltered information um, that then that I could then use to to say, you know, advise companies or. or you know, my superiors at the ministry as to this is what, you know, this is the priorities of, of Saudi Arabia right now. This is the trends that these are the trends that I see happening in the country. Yeah. And so to uh, kind of play that back to you, essentially, you're looking for uh, groups and individuals that might be able to promote economic activity back in Singapore, whether through trade or expanding markets, et cetera. Exactly. But I won't say it's just sometimes with economic diplomacy, right? I think diplomacy 
and um, extends as well to political uh, political diplomacy. And I think that uh, you know you, to use that Saudi Arabian example because that was my first posting. It's still my most uh, formative uh, years. I would say that my three and a half years in Saudi were even more formative for me than four years in college in the United States. Um, and I do think that those that time. Um, uh, you know, just being in 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 in, uh, in Saudi Arabia taught me how to the need for us to to the need for us as diplomats on the ground to really help our capitals answer that question as to what exactly was going on. Right, I I, I came when uh, the former king King Abdullah was uh, still uh, ill in hospital and on his deathbed and. There was these rumors as to okay, you know, the king's getting better or the king's not getting better. So you have to ask yourself, you know, you have to find out what is going on. Uh, and we knew that the new uh, king would be uh, King Salman, the current king, yeah, because he was then crown prince. But then once Salman took over, there was this question: okay, uh, would uh, you know who would he promote in 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 the cabinet? Right? I mean, back then, uh, his son uh, Mohammed bin Salman, up and coming prince, was not even um, minister of defense. So the big question was that who is he going to rise to the ranks? Would uh, Mohammed bin Salman start taking over some of the reins of power? And these were some of the questions that that I had to figure out on the ground. What have you learned about what people and governments of different cultures really want? And the reason I ask is because you'll, you'll look at from afar and it seems like one country is so different than another in their goals and their methods and such. But are you finding that, like, fundamentally people want the same things? I think that even beyond diplomacy, right, I think if we boil down this question to what humans want, I think everyone wants uh, to be to have a good time. They want to connect with people. They want to be listened to. So I think that one of the skills of a good diplomat is the ability to listen and and, you know, Sometimes we make the mistake of, of speaking too much and not hearing out the other side. So I think that people want themselves to be heard. Um, they want to, to to connect with what I call like the foreign other. Um, and even for a country like Saudi Arabia back then, uh, Saudi was very closed. Um, there was no such thing as tourism. It was just uh, foreigners would come for either business trips or for the pilgrimage. So Saudi Arabia was very close, but what, and I thought that the whole uh, country was like that before I'd been. But you get there and I realized that there were tens of thousands of Saudis that had gone abroad to study in universities in the US, in Canada, in the UK, in Australia. Uh, a lot of them were very well-traveled, knew a lot of the Western music and the culture and, and the TV, and they just wanted to meet people from from abroad and 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 to and to connect with them and this was the biggest surprising thing that i found about saudi arabia was um, that that openness beneath that that surface layer of cultural austerity was that openness that humor uh, and not to mention that beyond saudis there were there were so many lebanese and and palestinians and egyptians and and, and Jordanians who had lived in Saudi for decades. I mean, they their parents first came, then they were born often in Saudi Arabia and maybe just went back to Jordan or to Beirut for, for university. But by and large, they stayed in Saudi Arabia and then continued to, to also work in Saudi Arabia. So having that diversity around the Arab world, because that was my first, uh, first um, assignment in the Middle East after college, uh, gave me a very interesting front seat window into what was happening um, around the region. You mentioned media and movies and music. You know, when I when you hear you say that, I think about the concept of soft soft power. And you know, soft power obviously is a pretty big deal with the Olympics and what that means. Obviously, like a country that's had a lot of soft power recently is South Korea. A lot of music, a lot of movies right now. The United States saw, obviously always had a ton, or at least the last several decades. What does that mean um, in in regards to helping a country advance its goals or influence? I think that that soft power is is, is extremely um, uh, you know important, and you're right. I think that the South Korean example um, where 
you know, the last decade you have Korean TV shows like Squid Game and uh, Train to Busan, and then you have the food, right? And even in, in, in Singapore, um, before, all, all of us, when we were going out, you know, our favorite Asian cuisine would largely often be Japanese, but now I'd say it's Korean or Japanese 50-50. But even for a country like Singapore, um, we, you know, because we are, precisely because we are so small, that need to to have the soft power becomes very, very important and to have friends abroad and that encompasses everything from that promotion of Singapore food, right? So sometimes you would uh, hear about like the Singapore famous chili crab or that famous Singapore chicken rice or even, you know, have, seeing Singapore Airlines win best airline of the year on the Skytrax or having Changi Airport, um, even, you know, when tourists land in Singapore and they see the big jewel, like the world's largest, I believe, indoor, indoor waterfall. That to me is soft power when, when, you know, when people who have never been to Asia before, they land in Singapore, they see that the airport or they fly on Singapore Airlines and they get experience chicken rice. Or when the movie Crazy Rich Asians came out and people get to see, you know, the Singapore skyline. Uh, those are all aspects of soft power. And I think that when I was at the embassy, um, Sometimes when we held receptions, we would always try to serve a local Singapore gin. Uh, one of them was Brass Lion, and they had a, a, a gin that was made of blue butterfly pea flower that would turn purple when you add a tonic to it. But it was a great conversation starter when, when guests walked in um, and they were served this drink that went from blue to, to purple. And then we'll serve them Singapore slings. And some of them may know Singapore slings, others may not. but. It is these small touches that add up that that add up to a country's soft power uh, caution. When I think about Singapore, I do not necessarily, but now that you say Singapore sling is one that many people know, but I just think about you know my perception of how nice it is and how professional it is. You're talking about the you're, you're talking about the country. Maybe. Just the country, you know. I heard it's I hear it's pristine, and I think it has a reputation for strong business. Well, um, Singapore is known as like a, you know for better for better or for worse uh, Asian light, right? It's it's uh, I think one of the best things that our founding prime minister Mr. Lee Kuan Yew made was to to find a way to unite the different races because you know we are a country of 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 of, of many races of, of of immigrants, right? From uh, natives of the land, um, uh, uh, the Malays, and then uh, immigrants from southern China, like my ancestors, immigrants from from southern India, uh, largely, uh, and and so you you have several races in in one, you know, kind of like like Lebanon with 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 different religions uh, in Singapore. But one thing that he did was make sure that everybody speaks English. So English is the and a lot of foreigners sometimes don't believe they're like, oh, how's your English so good? I'm like, well, I've been speaking it as a kid because that was and is the official language, right? Obviously, all of us have to learn our 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 mother tongue. So in that case, this was Mandarin for me. Um, but English, all government documents are in English, and therefore, as a foreigner, as, a, as an expat, uh, when you want to move to Asia or maybe for a company to set up a shop in Asia, where would you do it? You do it either in Hong Kong. Or you do it in Singapore because that's where you know everybody speaks English. It, the ease of services and the safety. One of the world's safest, one of the world's safest countries. And and people don't believe it when I say that a twelve year old girl could walk down the street at two a.m. in any neighborhood in Singapore and be fine. It's remarkable. I mean, that is a, a form of soft power. Even just the reputation of a particular place or culture. You know, you've lived in a variety of different places, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, Singapore, obviously, United States. Now, how has it been building relationships in different cultures? I would say that maybe I'll start first with uh, the U.S. I would say that I'm very, very comfortable being back in the U.S. just because uh, I would say that four years of college was very, very good for teaching me how to 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 you know pitch and to sell uh uh, you know, my, my country uh, to uh, uh, to the American audience, right? Because I think that even even if someone could speak perfect English, there's a certain cultural distinction um, 
of or, or a kind of a key to 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 interacting with Americans, which I on on hindsight I think that if you're not if you have not spent enough time in the states, these might be kind of weird to you. Um, and so I, I I would say that it's great being back in the states. I, I watch a lot of American uh, TV and, and 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 movies and 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 books. So be I was a little apprehensive to be honest about coming back to the states, especially during election year. But after the first uh, forty eight hours, where I, I would need that time to get over the culture shock of being back in the states, it just felt like coming home. Um, Saudi Arabia was, I would say, the biggest challenge, but but initially, but just because everything was so so different. And although I speak Arabic and I've I've done internships around the Middle East, or I've done study abroad in like Morocco and Qatar and internships in Dubai, but I, I admit I was not ready for how austere Saudi Arabia back then was on, 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 on the outside. And especially for the first month, I was asking myself, oh my God, did I make a big mistake uh, you know, coming here? I, I couldn't believe that I, I couldn't believe at the time that I would have to spend another three and a half years uh, here. But I think that when you're thrown into the deep end and then you find a way to navigate that, and then you find that pocket of human connection that could then open new doors for you, for work, uh, you know, socially. I mean, I left, I, I teared up at my farewell speech when I was leaving Saudi because that was how much that those three and a half years meant to me. So once I, once I could tackle Saudi Arabia, I knew that when they asked me next to go to Egypt, uh, I knew that in comparison, I could, I could handle that. And then, uh, when it came when it came to when it came to the, going to a, to the states, I was like, well, you know, seven years in the Middle East, it, the U.S. cannot be any harder. So, yeah, yeah, it seems like I mean, from my experience interacting with other people in the United States, like, and it's not necessarily a tactic, but more a genuine interest. It's just an opportunity to find common ground. So when you meet somebody from some place, like you know, you went to Georgetown, is that right? Yeah. So Georgetown, you I mean, you have people from all over the country. So whenever you meet somebody from a particular country, oh, it's like, oh, yeah, I had a college classmate from Kansas City and he wouldn't stop talking about the barbecue. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. It's an amazing thing that that happens. Um, one thing I'm curious about, you know, you mentioned reading American TV or watching American TV and movies and reading books. How are you finding things changing as media changes and the, the what's behind that question is one thing I'm observing just in my, my daily life is people aren't necessarily referencing like movies or news anymore. They're they're referencing individual tweets. So a lot of people will be like, oh, yeah, a lot of people are worried about that um, housing crisis with affordability. And they might reference uh, there's a guy on Instagram that's pretty good named Freddie Smith. Or there's Scott Galloway from NYU. They might reference individual people as opposed to historic news sources. Well, I think this is the nature of, you know, this is the nature of the new media that we are looking at. And I think that we just have to, like, roll with the times. I, I admit that I held up for the longest time getting uh, Instagram. And then when I finally got it, I was, like, hooked, <laughs> hooked to it. So, for instance, I would get a lot of my my latest uh, restaurant and bar and travel recommendations from Instagram. I, I won't go through like a, you know, trip advisor to get that, that kind of, of, of reviews. But I think that, yeah, it, it's, it's a, it's both a symbol of the new media and the dynamism in that new media, but it's also a symbol of the growing poli polarization that, that we face and that I see a lot in, um, in the United States. And I think that, um, it will be interesting to see how that that new media, you know, what kind of influence does that have um, in the coming elections, and also, you know, things like foreign foreign efforts to undermine uh, that elections. Right? I mean, I think we have seen we have seen um, certain actors, both state and non-state, try to do that in not only elections in the states, but but also elsewhere. So. Um, yeah, that 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 all I can say is that that would be an interesting, you know, in the next couple of months things things would be very interesting, but but you know at least at least on on the TV, I, I, you're right. I would say that you know back to the issue of soft power. I think that um, that American export of 
of you know Hollywood and TV shows, right? And and it's just one of the things that that you know one of the powerful weapons that America has, which is in soft power. And when I was in Egypt, um, Egypt was and is that that kind of Hollywood center for a lot of films and 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 um, music and 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 Ramadan series. And for that reason. Uh, Everyone in the and everyone in the Arab world understands Egyptian uh, um, Arabic for that reason that they have exported all those uh, media uh, entertainment products. On the topic of um, like media and music and soft power, I mean, even in Hollywood, the guys who built Hollywood built the heroes that they needed in their real lives into the stories they were telling. And those stories obviously call um, craft and shape broader cultural stories. Have you seen like radical differences in the cultural stories that people share and hold on tightly to in these different areas that you've lived? I, I think that in in in, in entertainment, uh, you know, like TV series in general, there's a certain kind of nostalgic, like a throwback to the nostalgia, right? So I think when you look at a TV series like Stranger Things, right? And it's got a very, almost like kind of like that that Goosebumps horror series feel to it, you know, that old horror story by a campfire thing. And I think that as we become more and more digital and we start to lose that human connection, I think that the most successful movies and TV shows are, do, are those that kind of hop back to a simpler way of storytelling in which it is more organic is you know it's not filtered into the Jerry Bruckheimer kind of fancy CGI, but just relying on good script, good acting, and good messaging. And I think that one of the best uh, films that I watched last year was Past Lives, their Korean um, uh, romance uh, drama. But it's just so simple the way that the director Lin Song, you know, did the script and and the placement of of, of the characters. And I think that so once again that human element is going to be extremely important as we uh, as we become more digital and I think that even for the work of diplomacy right we can have all sorts of zoom meetings and we, we found that we could make that work during the pandemic when no one was meeting but that doesn't negate the importance of doing in-person events right be it a happy hour be it a, a formal black tie diplomatic dinner that an ambassador would host or be it a national day reception in which you toast to the country's president or the king of that country and you sing each other's national anthems and you showcase the best of, of the country's gastronomic offerings. I mean, I just don't see technology becoming that, uh, that advanced, at least in my lifetime, where we could substitute that. Do you have any favorite cultural traditions from other cultures? From other cultures, I... See, I'm a foodie, right? So if you ask me about the cultural traditions, I would say that I love uh, uh, the food. But I would say that uh, one of my favorite times of the year would be Ramadan, where where, where Muslims around the world would fast. And um, one, I, 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 I'm not fasting, but I, I, I get to eat all the meals that they're eating, so I gain a lot of weight. <laughs> um, but it's that kind of warm, you know, fuzzy feeling when everybody breaks fast at a certain time together as a community, as a family. Um, that to me was one of my favorite months of, 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 of the year during the seven years that I was that I was in the Middle East. So in terms of traditions, you know, where the best food is prepared and there's always a feast on the table. And uh, I would say that Arab hospitality can compete with Asian hospitality. So that was one of my favorite um, traditions. I would say in the States, Thanksgiving, uh, 4th of July is always a big is always a big thing for me, uh, something that I, that I like a lot. And then I, I would say back in Singapore is uh, uh, certainly, that National Day when we have uh, when we have the National Day parade that we just had it uh, last weekend, and uh, you know I wish I was there in, in, uh, in person to 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 see it. Yeah, a couple of years ago, I saw um, a New York artist named Tom Sachs. He did an installation at the Dallas Museum of Art, or actually the Nasher Sculpture Center in Dallas, with the Japanese tea ceremony. This artist is obsessed with the tea ceremony before. So this one was an immersive tea ceremony experience made out of like everyday items. Like he made um, one of the sheds out of like porter potty walls. 
you know, for the tea houses. And, you know, before that he did um, a mission to Mars or he reenacted a mission to Mars. No, no, no. It was a mission to the moon. And when the astronauts got to the moon, they performed a Japanese tea ceremony because he thought it was mankind's purest expression. Uh, and you're right. You're right. I forgot to mention like tea ceremonies, like the, the Japanese matcha uh, tea ceremony that they have, especially in Kyoto is one of my favorite things. And I think for us in Asia, um, interestingly enough, when uh, I'm not sure whether you know this, Adam, but when in, in Asia, especially in, in Chinese uh, uh, culture, if you're, if you're having lunch, we don't serve you water unless you ask for it. It's going to be cups and cups and cups and copious amounts of tea, right? And And so... Uh, what's interesting is when I have to go to an Asian restaurant in the States and then have to order like a, a pot of tea and they'd be like, oh, do you want one more? It's going to be another $5 for that tiny pot of tea. So I think that the art of drinking tea and, and, and the ritual behind it and, and, and the smell is something that, that is extremely important to to us, not just in Japan, but also in 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 uh, in, in, in Singapore. When like, you go to a Cantonese restaurant, it's, yeah. Do you ever feel the weight of imposter syndrome? when trying to assimilate to a new country or culture? No, oh, always. And I think that, you know, you never really um, get over that. And I used to have a lot bigger struggles with that feeling of imposter syndrome, and especially when I was younger. And, you know, right now, at least now that I'm older, I could say that, oh, I've had some years of experience working as a diplomat and knowing different cultures and living in abroad in various places. But I remember when I first was starting out and I couldn't even say that I had experience and you are thrust into this room with guys who are like way above your station of life, 10, 15 years older. You know, some of them are worth like hundreds of millions of dollars. And, you know, you're in your, 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 your suit uh, and you're sweating inside because you're, you're that nervous. Um, and even up to now, right? I mean, I do a lot of networking. I love it both, you know, both personally. I've always like meeting people and, and I've always been an extrovert and I like, uh, you know, just understanding people, connecting with people. But up to today, I still get nervous when I go to events, even if it's something that I'm hosting. Like part of me still gets nervous. I don't know why, but, you know, you have thought that I would have had all this practice. But once I'm in, once I'm in, like that nervousness, that nervousness dissipates. But when I'm on the way there, you know, on the car ride over, I, I always feel this, this, this weight of the imposter syndrome. But if you look at it, the good thing about the imposter syndrome is that it always keeps you keeps you on your toes, right? And it doesn't make you complacent because then it forces you to be like, okay, you know, I'm not enough. I don't understand this culture enough. I don't know enough people. And therefore I want to penetrate deeper rather than saying, okay, you know, I've, I've got it made. Uh, let me take it easy. I, I don't need to know anything about this culture, that culture. And so yeah, imposter syndrome, always feel it um and and it keeps me on my toes me too man i think it's very core to the human experience to feel imposter syndrome especially as you're pursuing your potential one thing i'm really curious to learn about is the diplomat's relationship with time for two reasons one is it can take a long time to um make an impact in a new country and also learn and such but also these relationships you're building, uh, they predate you in terms of Singapore and whatever country you're operating in, and they also surpass you. How do you think about the concept of time when building these global relationships? You know, I, I think that uh, one of my favorite qu quotes that someone said was uh, play iterated games, right? And I've always wondered what that meant. And I never really understood it until several, several years later. And I think that, you know, my takeaway from that is that it's precisely on the concept of time and building up those global relationships, right? Either on a country level or on a personal micro level. I, I, I think to me that concept is one and the same. Um, because with networking, right, they say that if you need that network now, it's too late. You need to have started building it 10 years ago. And so a lot of the, you know, for me, a lot of the networks that I've built up over the years, I still try my best to keep in touch with them. Yes, I don't talk to them every day. There's some friends I still do that I, I talk to on a near daily basis on WhatsApp uh, from my Saudi and, and Egyptian days. But I try to, you know, I attend people's weddings. 
I, 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 I go for the, you know, I, I try to travel across the world for birthday parties, uh, group trips together, because that is what, you know, it, it's kind of like tilling the soil, right? You need to keep on adding fer um, fertilizer and you just kind of build a relationship and be like, all right, bye guys, I'm gone and you don't see me for the next 10 years. That, that is not a good way of building a relationship. And I think that the best diplomats are those that understand that concept and even once they post things over, they can still maintain that relationship because you never know. Um, you might be sent back to that country uh, in this in in an official capacity or even in a private sector capacity. So it's very important to to always maintain those those relationships. And I like to think that all of us in the diplomatic service, um, or who were in the diplomatic service, still remain in that sense the best ambassadors for Singapore right? because it is through us that foreigners who have never tried ch chili crab or chicken rice or have no idea what a Singapore sling is or have never flown on Singapore Airlines understand what makes Singapore tick and 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 the country so uh, I remember I hosted uh, about 16 friends um, in 2016 in um, uh, 2016 for a group trip in Singapore and Bali and then when Crazy Rich Asians came out all of us went to see this in Beirut because we were attending one of their weddings and here's the thing all of them got the jokes because all of them were familiar with what makes Singapore tick. I'm curious, why why is it so important to move assignments every couple of years? Uh, you know, the joke is that so we don't go native, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, I I think one it keeps the brain fresh, right? I think that look, I was I was devastated when I had to leave Saudi after three and a half years. I I I didn't, I didn't want to leave. I thought I was just getting my groove in and. There's so much happening, but on hindsight, I'm glad I did because, you know, I got to go to Egypt and it was an entirely different challenge, uh, you know, meet a new set of people. Um, and so I think that about three years is a good time to really get to know a culture, get to know people, build up the network of contacts. Um, and I think that also you know, to be fair to the diplomat, right, who's also a human and not a robot or machine. Right. Uh, people don't want to be in the same kind of position or job for, for too long because things get stale, you start to stagnate. Um, and so, yeah, every time I go on a new place, be it living in a new city, doing a new internship, uh, am I scared? Always. Like, um, do I feel the imposter syndrome all the time? But I find that I become a stronger, more resilient person, a more adaptable person once, I, once I've been able to then just, you know, hit the ground running and just roll with it, right? It, it may not always be ideal. Sometimes circumstances may not always work out the way that you want it to, but you having that change keeps you dynamic, keeps you alive. And, and, and to me, that's, that's a very important concept. Yeah. Um, what do governments, so like you have ambassadors and diplomats all across the world gathering information about the nature of the cultures, the current events that people are worried about and so on. What kind of decisions do governments make with that information? It's such a varied thing, right? Because with, with foreign affairs, it could any, be anything from, okay, you know, what a, what might be a new agreement that we might want to sign with that country. And perhaps I could relate to you a story that, that many people may not know, but um, we are the first Asian country that the United States signed an FTA with in 2004. So this year marks the 20th anniversary of our FTA with, with the US. And it started, uh, I believe, in the 1997 and 1998 APEX Summit in, I believe this was in Brunei, in Bangasiri, Begawan. And our then Prime Minister Go Chok Tong had, had proposed to Bill Clinton, because then PM Go was a big golf fan, and he knew that, that Clinton played golf. And he was, they were trying to get a golf game set up, but the weather wouldn't allow it, and the two men had, got, had, had, had arrived to to the golf course, you know, close to midnight, the weather wouldn't let up, still like lightning, <laughs> lightning warning was activated. And then just when they're about to, you know, call it off, uh, it cleared and they said, you know, shall we do a quick round? And the two leaders did, and it was two of them talking, you know, on, on the golf course that, that our prime minister broached the idea of a free trade agreement. And then Bill Clinton said, "Yeah, send me the draft." And then <laughs> I think our guys just cobbled up a two-paragraph, <laughs> a two-page uh, statement. Bill Clinton it, Bill Clinton edited it by hand, 
send it back to us, you know, and once when both sides agreed, and then we released a statement saying that both countries will work together uh, to draft the first uh, U.S. Uh, Asia FTA, you know, with an Asian country, and this was signed in 2004. So, you know, to answer your question, um, and the broader question, like, what does a diplomat do and the value of diplomacy, right? Sometimes it is, it, or oftentimes it is that human connection, right? It's not in that, always in that suit and tie and sitting across from each other in formal statements, but oftentimes it's just that people to people exchange, right? Be it through activities, uh, culinary discoveries, sports in this case. Um, and then, then how, does, how do governments decide is this gives us or any country information as to what's going on and how best that we can advance our our national interests. Yeah, I could see it being as simple as something like promoting some sort of exchange business school program. It could be all sorts of stuff. Um, you've seen so many different kinds of governments and lived in so many different places and obviously worked with other other governments. How has being a diplomat for the last decade or so changed your view on the role of government? Uh, well, you know, I, I'm aware that in the state sometimes there is a, uh, there's a great skepticism on the role of government, depending on who you ask, right? But I would say that my role of government is also kind of colored by the fact that I, I work for the government, and um, and, and 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 in Singapore, there's always this I know, stronger, or I guess in Asian culture, right, there's a stronger adherence to kind of like that obedience to, to the state. Uh, you know, it's a very Confucian culture, but. But I would say that a, a government and how countries run, you know, whether government is corrupt or not, whether government is, is, is efficient or not, whether government is rent seeking or not, you know, whether government promotes investments into a country, I think that matters. And, and I'm blessed that, 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 that you know, in, in Singapore, we have had that, in, in general, very pragmatic um, government over the decades um, that and a very strong uh, civil service that that that, uh, that you know civil service or, or bureaucracy that backs up that helps government implement their decisions, and you know I, I think you look at Singapore's history right and just to like do a humble brag about about Singapore you look at Singapore's history, independent in sixty five right we're fifty nine years old this year, um, and 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 look at where that GDP has grown right. Um, U.S. foreign direct investment into Singapore is more than U.S. FDI into mainland China, South Korea, and Japan combined. And we are the size of New York City with 6 million people. So we have about, what, five, almost 6,000 U.S. companies in Singapore, regional headquarters for a lot of these American companies. And not even talking about the Japanese companies that have established the British companies, the French companies that have established and use Singapore as that regional base. So. Part of it is you ask, why would companies want to come to Singapore? Right? It is the sound economic policies and incentives that we put in. It is the rule of law, where where it is the lack of corruption. Where you go to Singapore, you're in a com you know you 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 are a company and you are foreigner and you set up in Singapore, and you're driving on the streets. You're not going to have to get a shakedown and have to pay bribes and and so that certainty, that rule of law, right? The fact that your wife can be out at midnight, walking by herself and not be worried that she's going to be robbed or shot. That makes a difference. And I think that, that you know, so you ask me, what is the role of government? I think that it is pivotal to a country's growth and development. It seems like Singapore, with its newness, has had a chance to learn from a lot of people and do some things differently in a way that's been really effective. You're a diplomat that grew up in Singapore, was educated in the U.S., and specialized in working in the Middle East, and now the United States. What's the concept of home to you? You know, strangely enough, I don't miss Singapore food as much when I'm away from Singapore. Um, but I, I'll say that I'm very proud every time I land back in Singapore. And you know, they say, like, you know, for Singaporeans, welcome back to, to Singapore and welcome to Singapore Changi International. Uh, part, partly it's also because, like, the airport is so, is so damn good and, and world class. But I would say home is where, um, home is where I can build the community, right? And I, I would say that because I've, lived and worked and, and studied abroad in, in so many different places I, I, and and suffering that imposter syndrome, it was necessary for me to make whatever place that I am now, be it a month or be it a year or three years, home. And, and, and I think that um, 
uh, you know, being back being back in the states, uh, I, I I thought that I would have trouble uh, fitting back in because I've not lived in the states since since college, right? I've not lived in the states since 2011. I, I visited, yeah, for weddings and 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 to see friends, but not not to live uh, since since college days. And I was thinking, okay, you know, there'll be a lot of lonely nights, a lot of uh, boring weekends by myself. <laughs> And yeah, no, that 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 fortunately didn't happen. So so yeah, I mean the states is now like home for me. S is Singapore, and then you know three months ago, um, so I picked up kite surfing when I was in Egypt. And three months ago, I flew thirty hours to go all the way to the Red Sea to kite again in Egypt. And I thought, okay, you know, I've not been to Egypt in two years, and I was wearing a cap, and I figured, all right, you know, no one's gonna recognize me here, uh, but. <laughs> I it was at this beach club and like the manager comes out and be like, "My, good to see you. I haven't seen you in a while." And so that was when I realized that that Egypt is, is also home for me. Right, and going to all my favorite spots in the Red Sea at the kite was just uh, incredible. To know that I also have a home there. Um, and and so yeah, the home for me is multiple places. It is not one fixed location, but it is based on the community that you built up, that you build up there. The Red Sea is on the top of my list. I really want to go scuba diving in the Red Sea. Do you see any parallels between kite surfing and global diplomacy? Mm, interesting question, right? I don't think anyone has. I don't think anyone has asked me that to link it with global diplomacy. But I would say, uh, all right, I, I, I guess I can give 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 a couple of lessons, right, off, off the top of my head. One, I would say that. The learning curve for, for kite surfing is pretty steep, especially for the first 20, 25 hours, right? And and I think that there were times where I was learning it, I'd be like, what the hell am I doing? Like, what did I get myself into? So I think that um, one lesson is, you know, you just have to persevere and it gets easier. And so same when you go to a new country and everything's foreign and you're uncomfortable and you're missing your 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 luxuries of life, and especially come compared to Singapore, right? Where it's so advanced, it's so comfortable, everything works. Uh, and sometimes when you're maybe in the, like in the Middle East, it's not always the same. Uh, so therefore you have that kind of adjustment issue. So same with the same with uh, kiting. But the second one is, but here's the thing about kiting, right? Is that with kite surfing, you need several kites, at least two, right? Like you need a smaller kite for stronger wind uh, and you need a bigger kite for, for, for lesser wind. So I think that sometimes in, 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 in diplomacy, especially when we are doing networking and trying to navigate, especially when, you know, sometimes it's, it's gray areas or society is very opaque and there are no written norms or, or, or customs. Um, you need like to have multiple quivers in your, in your, in your arsenal. So sometimes the contact that you want to reach out, is going to be much, you know, maybe the guy doesn't, doesn't do happy hour. You know, he he's a more formal person. Like maybe he likes meals but not drinks, or he does sports but doesn't drink. And and so then you need you need to have a variety of skills um, to understand what people want, what makes them tick, and then just adapt on the fly. So I, I would say that with kite surfing, that adapt adaptability is very important because sometimes the wind is not great. The wind is gusty, and that gust difference could be sometimes like 10, 12, 13 knots. So you're either really, really overpowered or really, really underpowered, and it's not a great session, right? There have been times where I'd be like, "Oh my god, I'm not kiting for the rest of the day because that's such a shit, you know, session on the water." But yeah, sometimes you just have to take it, it and just roll with it and 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 adapt on the go. Yeah, you got to be flexible and prepared for the unexpected. Mike, you've been so gracious with your time. It's a blast to learn about the life of a diplomat. What's the best way for people to keep up with you and the work you're doing? Well, uh, I'd say, you know, just add me on, add me on LinkedIn uh, I, or, or just like, you know, DM me on one of my socials. Um, I'm always very, I, I love connecting with people. Um, I love hearing stories. I, I love, uh, you know, doing my, my little best to pitch, to pitch for Singapore in any way that I can, right? E either on the food basis or in terms of the entertainment options or in terms of like the business potential of, of Singapore or, you know, to have Singapore companies come, come to the States. Um, I'm always trying to like find ways that we can expand our uh, room for to maneuver both on the diplomatic front but also on the economic front and i think that uh you know in a small country that battle never stops and i'm just proud to to 
to try to play a part in that. We'll have links to your LinkedIn in the show. I appreciate you sharing your story and coming on the show. Sure, Adam. Well, thank you so much for inviting me. This was uh, this was this was great. Yeah. See you soon.